So with that tip of my hat to the Vermont Humanities Council and the National Endowment on the Humanities, I'd like to introduce Katie Krauts. What is really fun about this is Katie was a student at the Center for Northern Studies, and we first started talking about <laughs> schools in, on the island of Ursk, which is the northernmost island in Shetland, and talking about what it means to uh, have music in the community and what it means to have traditional music there. And the reason that, um, well, probably the reason that we're still really becoming colleagues and friends at this point is because of Katie's fiddle. When we were there, she brought her fiddle with her, and when she took it into the primary school, uh, and they saw that she had a fiddle, all the children went out. They all had fiddles from six feet size. Yeah, tiny, tiny. tiny, tiny. <laughs> so, um, and I'm going to turn that over to you in just a minute, but the reason, because Katie had her fiddle, because she was interested in music, it suddenly gave us something to connect with the community. They had us dance with them, they had us play music with them, they invited us to church, they gave us, they came to our dinners. We had a lot of fun with the community, but maybe I'll turn it over to you and you can tell us about um, Northern Fiddle. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, Katie. Um, it is really fun to be here uh, after uh, having grown up in the area and then gone to the Center for Northern Studies and always been interested in uh, Northern culture, uh, Northern music, especially Swedish fiddling um, being my focus. And I think what I'm going to do is actually start off with a fiddle tune just so that you have an idea of um, you know, why this might draw somebody in. So um, I'll do that first.
I was worried there for a minute. Katie said, you should start with a slideshow so there's no technical difficulties. <laughs> Maybe she was right. <clears throat> So, yes, it was really inspiring to go um, on that trip with Katie uh, and the other students to the Shetland Isles. Um, and it did strike up an interest in northern music. Um, and I had listened to some other Swedish music um, throughout the years and was very drawn to a couple things about it. Um, I'm really drawn to harmonies. I'm drawn to the full sound of double stops, which is two strings playing at once and drones. Um, and they have a very interesting quality which plays with, um, this is Swedish fiddle music, which plays with uh, the major key and the minor key, um, the dark and the light, and sort of intermixing those into one tune. And so I had a curiosity about that and what that might mean um, for the culture and in society. So I just knew my whole life that I had to go there and explore this tradition. So. Um, I started making connections a few years ago. Uh, a lot of fiddlers who are into the old time scene, which is what I'm into, it's American Southern uh, style of fiddling, are also interested in Swedish music. And I'm, I'm sort of curious why. And I think it has something to do with that draw towards the harmonies and the double stops and the richness of um, those two strings being played at once the whole time. And rhythmically, it's very um, driving and it's very... Um, continuous. It's less melodic and more rhythmic music um, and chordal, so it's changing from chord to chord and you can hear that major and minor effect as well. Um, so I was talking to some old-time musicians such as Bruce Molsky and Brittany Haas, people I've always looked up to and asked them, you know, where should I go if I'm going on this trip? And they gave me a few leads, but not many leads because I think they knew that um, really the way to journey is to go to a place and let things unfold. And that's really exactly what happened. Um, so I'll start by showing you some slides of Stockholm and, and my arrival there. And then it sort of weaves into this whole scenario of me being involved with this very magical fiddle camp. Um, there are fiddle camps all over the world. And they're for adults and children, um, people of all levels. And it's, it's really interesting how they actually function quite similarly. And I found the fiddle camp I arrived at, happened upon, um, was very similar to the camps I had been, been at here. Um, that turned into a festival, and that turned into this journey across to Norway, where I met up with a friend. And I'll, I'll show slides of that trip as well. I'll also show some videos of different fiddling styles that I encountered at the camp. And the people teaching at the camp were very professional. Um, they tour all over the world. Um, people I had heard of for years, and all of a sudden, I'm sitting there studying with them. So uh, that was pretty great to capture that on, on video as well. So <clears throat> I'll start here in, um, in Stockholm. And this is what a small street in Stockholm might look like, overlooking the bay there. Um, and Stockholm is made up of a number of small islands. Um, and it's really fun to sort of travel around each island. You could walk around the whole of each island in a couple hours. And then you can take a ferry to the next one. And it's really common to just leap around like that. Uh, this little red boat here at the bottom is where I stayed for the first night. I had no contacts there, so I just sort of ended up staying on, on this hostel boat. Um, and the rooms are really, really tiny, so I wasn't that happy. I also was very jet lagged, so I slept a lot. Um, and I started making contact. I did have my iPhone with me. And I made contact with um, someone Brittany Haas, a fiddler, had recommended I meet. And her name is Anna Lindblad. And Anna is, is a renowned fiddler in, um, in Sweden. And she's about my age. And she went through uh, a school called the Royal Academy of Music there. And you can actually major or even get a master's in traditional Swedish fiddling. So she had just completed that program. And she said, yeah, sure, stop by while you're in Stockholm. I said, I have one more day. Can I meet up with you? She said, yeah, I'm the girl in the red coat. When you get off the subway, just come on over and meet me. So I went and I found the girl in the red coat, and she brought me to her house. And, um, 
And we stayed at her house for a night, and uh, she introduced me to some other musicians who I actually stayed in contact with um, all this time and, and brought them over to the winter festival that happened here last weekend. I don't know if anybody, did anybody go to that? Raise your hand if you went to the festival. Great, yeah, so Friday night's concert was with Anna and her friend Ryan, who I had met over there. Um, so that was really neat to be able to hold on to that connection and bring them here. Um, and the next day I went up to this, uh, to the uh, castle, or the, the, what do you call it? Royal Palace, <laughs> um, where, you know, I had come to Sweden to look for traditional music, and I'll show you a clip of the first impression I had of Stockholm. Stockholm. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, oh, wow, this is interesting. I wonder if I'll have a hard time finding traditional music here. Um, and it is interesting because... There is some sort of like regalness <laughs> happening. Um, you see it in the architecture. You see it in their taste. Their um, they have very like um, what's the word? I'm out of words. Formal, yeah, or distinguished taste in things. Um, things have to be just so, and everything is very tidy and very clean. Um, so I kept thinking, regal, regal. How does this relate to the music? that I've been listening to all this time. So I was a little concerned, <laughs> um, but with Anna's help, she did some touring around the city with me. I encountered some, some really beautiful architecture. This is uh, the Nordic Museum, um, where they give a, a wonderful history of Scandinavian culture and with a special feature on the architecture and design. And they, they actually had a number of rooms set up where you could follow uh, the progression of design through decades, all the way up to IKEA. So I thought that was a really interesting display. They have a huge emphasis on um, fiber arts as well. I wore my hand knit Swedish wrist warmers that Anna gave me recently. Um, people really value those kinds of things, aesthetics basically. And it's a really beautiful city, lots of green um, walking areas. There's an outdoor museum which takes up a, an entire island. Um, and you can just walk around the whole museum outside and learn about the culture and the history that way. Then I, I went on this train up to where I heard there was this fiddle camp happening. And I had been loosely in touch with somebody involved with the fiddle camp. Her name was Elika Frizzell. And Elika tours the world. Um, she's a fiddle player and plays with people in Africa, plays with a lot of people here. Um, and so a, a fiddler from here connected me with her. She said, if you're going to go to a Swedish fiddle camp, this is the camp you have to go to. It's called Hovra. And it's in a town named Hovra um, on this farm. And she didn't really tell me much more than that. Um, I was just hoping you know, to find some fiddle tunes and to learn some fiddle tunes from instructors. I took this train north, it's about four hours north of Stockholm, and uh, as you can see, the logging industry is uh, really the main economy up there. And then I arrived at this beautiful farm. Um, it was maybe 50 acres of land surrounding this farmhouse, this complex of farmhouses. And um, I didn't know if I was really in the right place because the trains over there travel to very rural areas. And so, you know, I got off in Hovra and um, there was somebody there who said they were going to the camp. So I got in the truck with him and went to the camp and arrived. And there wasn't really anybody around. And in fact, it ended up I had arrived a day early. And so there were a few people, but not everyone ha had arrived yet. Um, this is the house I stayed in, and um, they had assigned rooms to people who said they were going to sign up for this. So, um, of course, because I was sort of a last-minute entrant, um, they didn't have a room for me. <laughs> so they said, just you know, pick a bed that looks like it's not picked yet. So I went in this door, <laughs> and of course, no one had arrived yet. So I had a lot to choose from. <laughs> But this was the room I picked. It's, um, again, their emphasis on aesthetics is really strong. The wallpaper was beautiful. There's a lot of folk art. I'm not sure that a, 
a typical farm would look this way. The people who lived here and um, had owned this farm for forever were artists, and so I think they put a lot of care and attention into preserving the folk art. This is the wallpaper hand stamped with this pattern on it all across the wall, as big as that wall, really. And then um, in every room there were, there were these little pieces of folk art on the walls, embroidery. They put moss in the windows. Um, and this is, this is still a tradition to collect the moisture. And this is something I hear they also did in Vermont back in the day. Um, and, and in uh, Sweden, they put little trinkets also in the window that sort of tell a story or are good luck. This sort of looks like a Vermont farmhouse. So then um, after a night of just sort of getting to know the grounds and walking around, um, of course it's light out until about 11. Um, this was in late May, so um, I knew I wouldn't be sleeping very much trying to get used to that. But early in the morning we started fiddle classes. And the unfortunate part is I didn't know any Swedish when I went over there. And I was the only foreigner at this camp. They had never had a foreigner there before. Um, there was this other guy who was teaching fiddle, but this is Ryan who came and played the festival, actually. Um, but, and he was there on a Fulbright studying Swedish fiddle music. But he was only there for a little part of the day, and he was only there teaching, so I, didn't, I couldn't use him as a resource, really. And they all do speak English very, very well over there. But because I was the only foreigner, there was sort of no reason to cater the whole class to me. And it's much easier for them to just get along in Swedish. So I unfortunately couldn't collect any of the names of the tunes that, <laughs> that I was learning. And I often would miss things like where dinner was or <laughs> that I should have been on the bus going to the next town or whatever. It was, it was pretty difficult, but, um, you know, music doesn't necessarily need language to be transmitted, so um, I gladly was in class and collecting the tunes anyhow. Um, and this is Elka Frizzell, who told me about this camp, and so I took her class first off, and I'll play a little video of her playing. was a tune I had to learn on the first day. <laughs> it's very technically difficult music to learn coming from my perspective. Um, playing southern old time music is an entirely different animal. <laughs> um, but I was, I was really excited and what I was having trouble with was the rhythm and I'll, we'll listen to a little bit more. It's not a straight rhythm, you know, you can't just clap along to it. Um, and if you watch the way that they're tapping their feet, um, these instructors, it's, it's on a different beat. And so to get used to that, I wasn't quite sure what to do. I did notice also my bow when I was trying to play the tune with the class was always going the opposite direction. <laughs> and what it told me is that, you know, these things really get ingrained in us. And for them, it's second nature. I mean, even for a beginner who's learning fiddle, it's second nature to tap your foot in that way and to, um, you know, the bow to be going in certain patterns. It's because that's music that, um, especially some of these striving musicians, people who are really excited about the music, that's what they're hearing all the time. And I realized I, I'm not hearing that all the time, and so um, I knew that was going to be a challenge right, right off the bat. This woman is Mia Marin, and she is, um, she is married to a man called Mikkel, who is in a band called Vesson. And Vesson is a really well-known band. They tour all over the world. Um, so I, I didn't even know who these people were. And then when I learned who they were, I was like, I've been listening to that music forever. <coughs> so I was really excited to stay with her. I'll play you a tune she taught me in a little bit. Um, I might be able to play this one for you.
Dansk Kalling då, som är från min lilla by i Gunnarskog. That's what I was hearing all day. <laughs> So I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there watching her play and the sun is pouring in and it's warm um, and the music was just so resonant and so full, especially with the two strings being played at once. I was really, really happy during this fiddle camp, even if I couldn't learn all the notes. Um, and I think everyone else was feeling that way too. So again, I'm connecting with these Swedish people I can't even really talk to um, just by listening to the music. Um, they also had Norwegian fiddle instructors, and I just wanted to show this as a contrast to the <coughs> Swedish music. Um, they're all, there are all different types of Swedish and Norwegian music. Each region has its own style, and in fact, each region usually has a person, like there's a lineage of fiddling, like a person that is passing down the music. Um, and a actually, often the names of the fiddle tunes are uh, said like, you know, fiddle tune from, or Polska from Bjornstabi in the Hovra region, or something like that. That's the name of the fiddle tune. They don't have proper names. So, um, again, it's really hard to keep track of what tunes you're learning. But this is one style of Norwegian playing, uh, and Nor Norway is known for the Hardanger fiddle, which is a fiddle that has sympathetic strings resonating underneath the regular strings that are being played. Um, so it's extremely resonant and loud, and they'll often change the tuning of the fiddle so that you can get more volume out of it and more drones. Um, and this woman's name is Eva, and she's sort of up and coming in the Norwegian fiddle scene. <laughs> And one more here.
I'll just say a couple things about, um, I'll speak to Swedish music because I was really there mostly studying Swedish music. Uh, but it, it does cross over a little bit to other Scandinavian fiddle styles. Um, there's something called the Polska, and these names are also the names of dances that go with that style of fiddling. And the Polska is in a 3-4 time. So you count 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. <laughs> and for us, that might translate to a waltz. But the, pol the Polska over there, that, that comes from, a, I guess, a Polish word or, or um, something having to do with pol Poland. <laughs> um, it's also called a pulse or Polsk. Um, their emphasis changes a little bit. And for a waltz, it might be one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And that goes with the dance. You have the emphasis on the one. For this style of music, that's very flexible. And region to region, it can be different. You might find the emphasis on the three and the one. And if you were watching her foot, it sort of goes like that. Three, one, two, three, one, three, one, three, one. Um, and that's sort of underlying, and you'll see in the dances there's some of some of that going on in the dance moves too, um, and and the one two the two in the middle depending on what region you're playing from it changes, um, and this might be complicated for people who aren't uh, oriented around music theory, but uh, you'll just notice that there's a lot of flexibility with where those emphasis where that emphasis lies. That made it really hard to learn because one person might play a single tune one way with some strength and certain bow strokes and then you go to play it with someone else and they'll play it differently. Not only the, the notes but also the rhythm of it is very different. Um, so I think that's why some of this music became very regionalized is because people in a certain region would only play it like that and it would actually be hard to translate that to another region or even across the country's border. Um, from Sweden to Norway. They might play the same tune, but just the beat of it might feel really different. There's also the Schottisch, uh, which is a dance also. Um, and Schottisches are often like um, in a 2-4 beat, so almost like a march. Um, and it also sort of plays around with the, the beat emphasis. Um, and some people have likened it to like a slow polka. And the origin of that is Scottish and German. Um, and they even call it there when they're speaking in English, they call the Schottisch a Scottish. Um, and that's where I, I asked, I said, is it related to like a Scottish country dance or something? And they said, exactly. <laughs> so when we say Schottisch, maybe we should be calling it a Scottish. <laughs> um, so let's see. What I find at the camps that I go to here um, in America, again, they happen everywhere. I usually go to West Virginia to study fiddle music at these sort of camps. Um, what happens is usually you take a morning class, and in the afternoon and evening, it's sort of open to doing whatever you want to do. And jam sessions arise out of that. And that's what I love about these things is, um, you know, they help you learn the tunes, but then really the point the highlight of the day is playing it with other people. And this is something that is so entirely universal about traditional music. And it's what really gets me excited. And as some of you know, um, with my involvement with the Summit School, that's, that's the point, is really so we can play together. Um, and I loved being there and finding ways to be able to play with them, because that also crossed so many cultural boundaries. I couldn't you know, speak Swedish, but I could play their fiddle tunes with them. Um, and so you know, in the evenings, this is what we would do. And you'll notice that there are people of all levels and all abilities trying to play this tune together. But they're all really into it. You know, and you come away with it just feeling really good. And then you can talk about it. So it provides you know, something to really bond over for the rest of the night. <laughs>
So who knows what that instrument is that he's holding? What's it called? Nickel harpa, right. So the Hardanger fiddle um, is from Norway, and the nickel harpa is a Swedish instrument. And before I went over there, I really didn't know the difference very well, or at least I knew of the two instruments, didn't know where they were from. Um, and this also has sympathetic strings that resonate, and this box where um, the music can just resonate so much that it almost sounds like there's reverb or like a big echo put um, on the music naturally. Um, and I have another video of this that is my favorite video that I took, I'll show you, and you can really hear that. Um, but I got to sit down with this, this guy, I forget his name, but he's 17, and he was there on a full scholarship to study, and his goal was to go to the Royal Academy of Music and just study nickel harpa for the next five years of his life, um, which is just so cool you can do that. Not only can you do that, but the government pays for your tuition. And even if you're a foreigner, you can get enough scholarships to pay for your tuition to go to school in Sweden. And there are similar programs in Norway. Um, they just support the arts so much, so well. <clears throat> so the, one of the first nights I was there, there was some jamming. And then all of a sudden, everyone disappeared. And again, I was completely left in the dark as to what was going on. I was thinking, I thought we'd be playing all night long and like, you know, there'd be snacks out, and we'd all be warm and happy and enjoying it, and just there was nobody around. Um, so I, I looked in the bedrooms. No one had gone to bed. And I sort of wandered around the grounds. Um, and this happened over the course of the evening. It wasn't like all, of a, all at once everyone disappeared. It's just suddenly there were just a couple of us there. Um, and they didn't really know what was going on either. So we wandered around, and we did hear music coming out of the barn, the barn which looked totally decrepit, looked like maybe hay and a tractor was in there or something. And um, we peeked in and we saw that there was this barn dance going on this whole time. For hours this had been going on. And uh, there was a bar set up in, in the barn. And um, this really changed the experience for me, knowing how to dance to the music. And that's another thing I really love about traditional music is it's very closely tied usually with um, a dance or dancing. And um, once you learn the dance steps, you can really get that rhythm much more easily. So I'm glad I discovered this on the first night because then you know my bow was going in the same direction <laughs> as everyone else and my foot was tapping appropriately by the end of the week. Um, and this was another great way to just sort of connect with the people without needing to talk a whole lot. The dances were really interesting. Who here has danced to this kind of music? Yeah. So um, I don't know what I was expecting. I've seen it done at the Montpelier Contra Dance, um, and they used to do it often between songs or during the intermission. And I haven't seen it as much lately. Um, people around here seem to not know as as much as they used to when I was growing up here. But um, it's very confined, sort of. You walk around. Uh, sort of, you know, with relaxed steps, but you walk around as a couple in a circle. And especially here, when I was dancing, you spend most of the time walking around in a circle. And then all of a sudden, you'll spring into some spinning. And the spinning is very much a release, and it feels really good to just be with someone who's really supporting you, and you can just spin around in this pattern. Um, but then you go back to walking. And it's a certain walk, you know, it's with the rhythm um, of the Polska, but um, you know, I was expecting something a little more lively with all that music. If you think about the Norwegian music we're hearing, that's um, pretty energetic, driving stuff. But this is what they do to it. And there are, there are other dances that happen, but this is what I saw mostly. Um, 
and it was really lovely to walk in there and just see this happening. It was very beautiful. It's like, where am I? <laughs> um, so this whole camp and the farm belongs to and um, is an idea created by Bjorn Stabi. And Bjorn Stabi, I had no idea who he was before going over there, but it ends up, I have CDs of Swedish music um, with him playing on it that I've been listening to for years. But in my mind, you know, that name was just sort of one of many Swedish names on that, on that CD. Um, but people started to talk to me about Bjorn, and I hadn't seen him yet until this night um, when I took this video, you'll see. And Bjorn is probably in his late 70s, and he is considered a national treasure. And what that means in Sweden is that the government pays him a salary for life to just do what he does, which is teach fiddle, um, practice as an artist. He does incredible art. I brought one of the pieces he gave me um, to show you. He reminds me a little bit of Peter Schumann. He is very eccentric but wonderful, politically driven artist. Um, and he also believes very much in passing down this tradition of fiddling. So he has these camps at his farm. Um, and he's a really interesting character. I, I sat down with him, I actually spent a couple days after the camp just with him and his wife on the farm. Um, they were so kind to just have me there. And he taught me some fiddle tunes himself, but he also told me some stories. And one of the stories he told me, and I, I had no idea who I was dealing with here. I didn't know he was a national treasure until after all this really happened. Um, he told me that in the 60s, Pete Seeger had been traveling around Sweden and other parts of Scandinavia collecting music traditions and, and listening to the music and meeting people. And he enco encountered Bjorn and brought him over in 68 to play the Newport Folk Festival in America. <laughs> and they've been very close friends ever since. So I'm sitting at the table, like, eating dinner with him and his wife, and he's telling me he's, like, one of Pete Seeger's best friends. And <laughs> I was, again, just like, where am I? This is amazing. Um, and I had found the right person to study this music from. I mean, he is, he's the guy to go to. And all of the people at the camp, you can see, they all want to be up here. They want to be close to him. Um, you know, he's preserving a tradition, and he's played his whole life. He learned from his father. Um, you know, so he's, he's very well loved. I'll tell you another story he told me in a little bit, but I want to show this clip of him playing.
So I'm not kidding, that was about one or two in the morning. And you know, the sun had just gone down and it was gonna come up at like five in the morning and um, it just goes on and on. And, and you know, things are building energy around this time. And so this, this festival was sort of the kickoff of the festival season. People were really excited. And this is the landscape. I, I captured a little bit of what the farm looked like. That's the house that I stayed in. I think a complex of three houses. This fencing is, is really common there. I just wanted to capture that. I hadn't seen that style over here very much. Um, and this, this whole fiddle camp turned into a festival where people flocked from all over the nation um, to be with Bjorn and it sort of revolved around him and also just play tunes all day and all night long. And this is a, a, my favorite video of the Nickel Harpa and this boy who actually completely befriended me, followed me around everywhere because he is totally obsessed with American old time music. <laughs> and the people over there really, really love um, old time. And I was there clinging on, you know, to learn Swedish music, but. You can just hear how resonant that instrument is. It sounds like you're in a big concert hall or something. Um, so all, all weekend long was this festival, and I got to try out all the Swedish tunes I had learned. And of course, you know, I learned maybe 20 or 30, but only really captured two or three of them in that time. It was very intensive. Um, and they had these beautiful concerts after the day-long sort of jam sessions in different venues around um, this small town of Hovra. And festivals there are called Spilma Stemmas. Um, so this was Spilma Stemma Hovra. And this is one of the concerts I saw. I just want to show for a little while. This was completely dark. They didn't have any electricity in this small church. It reminded me a lot of Old West Church, actually, in Calais. Um, and this is one of my favorite concerts, and it's a, a woman who is very well-known Swedish fiddle player with a French accordion player. Um, and there's a lot of collaboration like that. In Europe, you know, getting places is so easy, and other music is so accessible, um, that there are some pretty amazing collaborations happening right now. So that was my last night at this camp, and uh, it was 
really, really a magical experience to just happen upon this and make connections as I went and learn the style of music, connect with people enough that I'm already planning to go back um, potentially at the end of May and catch the same festival and, um, you know, you just long for it afterwards. So that was, that was a really wonderful experience. Um, I'll tell you the one, the one last story that Bjorn told me on my last night there. And it's just a sweet story, but um, he said, and it sort of expresses, I think, how, um, how people think and how there's this element of fairy tale and magic in, in how people express themselves, how the music comes across, and um, the storytelling itself. There's a lot of sort of magic involved. But that's what I was also feeling in the moment was like, wow, this is a really magical experience. So Bjorn sat me down and he said, he was hired once to play at this very wealthy person's house. And he was saying this all in broken English, so it was really hard to really get what he was trying to say. But um, he had been hired by some wealthy people to play a party, and he had chosen to play some tunes that he thought everyone would just really like. Um, they're sort of popular, sweet, traditional Swedish tunes. And then um, he started feeling like he was sort of being pushed aside from the social group there, and he was, he was just sort of not feeling great about playing an environment like that. He really values like teaching people and being sort of community with people and playing with others. Um, so he decided to play a tune that he felt like um, carried sort of, not a curse, but like more weight. <laughs> and it was a hefty tune, sort of like the Norwegian stuff we were listening to. Um, and it's, it was called something like the Nature Song or the Nature Polska or something like that. And he started playing it, and he saw out of the corner of his eye this small creature coming out of the woods. And it started approaching him, and he was sitting on the grass sort of in front, in front of a deck or a patio where everyone else was socializing. And everyone started freaking out about this animal. They thought maybe the, the fox that was coming out of the woods was rabid or something like that. And um, Bjorn, you know, sort of glanced at it, and he sort of felt, like, connected to this fox. And so he kept playing the tune, and finally they were like, this fox is not going away. Why don't, why don't you come sit up on the deck with us and, you know, let him be, because for some reason he's, like, attracted to you right now. And so he got up on the deck, um, and he started playing the other tunes. And then after a while, he's like, I'm going to try to play that tune again, because he actually really liked the nature song or whatever it was called and wanted to play it. So he tried again, and sure enough, the fox <laughs> comes out of the woods and sits about five feet from him, just off of the deck, just looking at him. And everybody's like, you need to stop playing. Like, why don't you come in the house? They, you know, this, there's something wrong with this fox. And Bjorn refused, and he just, you know, sat there and finished the tune. And the people were, you know, sort of like wondering what the heck was going on. And he stopped playing the tune, and he said the fox sort of, you know, dipped its head at him, and sort of bowed to him, and trotted off into the woods. <laughs> and um, ever since, in Bjorn's work, he, he always puts like a little fox into, into his artwork. His artwork is very abstract, and the fox has become this big theme, and he always likes to talk about it. Um, but to me, it was also sort of just, uh, you know, elevated the the magical moments, uh, you know, I was feeling and that there really felt like there was magic in the air around Bjorn and around everything I was experiencing. So he saw me off with that story, um, brought me to the train station, and that's Bjorn and Vivjeka, his wife, seeing me off. And I'll just sort of buzz through the next few photos. Um, I ended up taking a train to Norway. And I just have to show these photos because they're so beautiful. Um, and that was, that was, oops, that was on the, on the way to, Nor that was just crossing over into Norway. And then I ended up in Trondheim. Still hadn't seen, you know, what I thought of as Norwegian mountains and uh, majestic landscape and all that. Um, but I came to Trondheim where I met up with a friend's father and he's an architect, 
and he gave me an incredible tour of Trondheim. And what I found interesting about both Sweden and Norway um, is that there's this juxt juxtaposition of modern and old happening all the time. Um, he took me directly to the boatyard where I could see these old, old ships um, and uh, a lot of restoration of old boats, really beautiful boats. But then he took me on a tour to look at all of the modern architecture. And as some of you probably know, Norway is one of the leaders in modern architecture. Um, some really interesting stuff and a lot of green building. That was some hotel. They had um, like permanently fogged over the windows. I thought that was strange. <laughs> and then we went up, you know, just outside of the city and got to see this beautiful farm, beautiful landscape. And this is, um, I played a show on this street in a small cafe in the waterfront. And then I got on a bus uh, the next day and went down to a place just south of there called Ondelsnes. And it's this tiny, tiny town tucked way into the fjordlands. Um, and this bus ride was spectacular. The bus went over fjords, under fjords. Like we started going straight toward the water, straight toward um, a fjord. And we didn't stop. We just kept going. And it went down really deep because these are very deep fjords. Um, and then at one other point, we got on a ferry boat on the bus. So like a big Greyhound type bus going on a ferry. I had never done that before. And there were like three people on the bus. <laughs> and they were all going to this very rural area. I mean, public transportation is incredible. They'll take you right to the farm that you're staying on which was here. <laughs> and my friends were house-sitting on a sheep farm. Um, sheep farming is, <laughs> it just got better and better. <laughs> sheep farming is um, a very old practice, and people will pass their sheep farm down through um, generations. Uh, people my age are taking over the farms, um, you know, sort of becoming more popular to move on to their grandparents' farm. This is my view from my bedroom. And it was so quiet. I mean, all you could hear were sheep. So after the fiddle camp, which was music all the time, all the time, um, it was very nice to be in this environment. Mm -hmm. Different ways of gardening there to extend the season. They have these boxes. A lot of sod roofs, traditional buildings. Yeah. And that's their house. And that's Josh and Oro. Josh married a Norwegian woman uh, this year, and so he'll be living over there, and I hope to visit again. <laughs> we even went swimming in the fjords. Very colder than <laughs> colder than the main ocean in winter. No, just kidding. <laughs> so, and and the reason why I'm also showing these slides from the trip, um, it is related to music and my musical experience. Um, I had arranged for a show in this small town. Josh, my friend, um, there with the little mandolin and the checkered shirt. He and I used to play in a bluegrass band here called Skunk Hollow Bluegrass Band. It's more like a country band um, way back, maybe six, seven years ago. And, um, you know, I, I went over there, and I don't usually play solo, so I was a little nervous about that. And I said, well, maybe you could recruit some Norwegians <laughs> to play along. And so he recruited some locals. And what I found amazing is that everybody plays music, and they are all very good. I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of people there play music, and they are very good. Um, it's not just because they have nothing else to do. It's because they have access to instruction, to really high-quality instruction. Um, usually studying things like music and the arts is free, um, or there are scholarships available to make that happen. So 
I was really excited to play with <laughs> these amazing musicians. Um, we are called Katie Trouts and the Norwegian Tall Boys. <laughs> <laughs> and I also found it really interesting to, I could, I felt like when I started playing my music, I could barely remember how to strum the guitar because I was in the Polska beat. And you know, to go from one world to the other was sort of challenging. And I just caught a couple of really funny clips of them playing along. Notice how small the bass is compared to the huge Viking Norwegian man. <laughs> no. um, that, he, that bass actually had a problem. It, didn't, it couldn't be like uh, elevated or whatever. So he wasn't really just that big. <laughs> American music. They love country music. I arrived and they immediately started at this venue, they immediately started asking for Dolly Parton covers. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's not quite the kind of country music I play. And people came in their duds. They came with, you know, cowboy boots and cowboy hats on. And I don't know what they expected, but <laughs> this was the venue. Not bad. <laughs> Uh, this is a stave church, which is a really old, very old um, style of church building. And these are the sod roofs. Um, in the mountains, uh, sheep herders would go up there and stay a summer with the sheep. I actually got to herd some sheep while I was there. And um, you can tell just how old these buildings are by how tall the trees are growing on them. I mean, look at this one. You can barely tell it apart from the landscape. This was on my birthday. I spent there, um, hiked a mountain. This is probably about 10 at night, actually. And then I went to Oslo uh, to catch my flight home. And I actually did not have a very great experience in Oslo. It's so expensive. I got. Um, nachos, which came with a side of salsa, didn't even have anything on it, and it cost me $40. <laughs> and they wouldn't let me take it home afterwards because I couldn't eat a whole tray of chips. <laughs> um, but this is the boatyard, which was very beautiful, and they're uh, building up this boardwalk, uh, and there are some really nice little eateries, and um, not that you could eat there, but. <laughs> some interesting architecture as well. This is the Opera House, which is just as you're leaving um, at the train station. You can go and actually walk on the roof of this Opera House. And that's, that's it for the slideshow. So um, I guess you know what, what was most eye-opening to me, if I could sort of sum that up, is the universal language of music. Um, I knew it was going to be that way. I didn't know exactly what was going to happen, if I would be able to keep up with the fiddle tunes or even maintain them. And I'll show you a couple more fiddle tunes after this. Um, but, you know, what I found is that it really translates in many different cultures the way that traditional music is a, is a community building activity. And, um, you know, to be able to, you know, learn some tunes loosely and sit down with a group of people and then continue to know those people for years to come. Um, Anna, 
you know, who I had visited there in May, was just here. And as I said, I'm planning my trip back, and she's going to help me get there. And, um, you know, I think that it's almost less about the music being made and more about making the music together. So that was my Scandinavian adventure. Open it up to questions if you guys have any, um, but I could play you a couple tunes first. What's your preference? Tunes, tunes first, and then questions. Okay. <clears throat> this is a tune I learned from Mia Marin, um, the blonde, one of the blondes <laughs> who was teaching. And um, she's the one who was married to Mikkel from Vessen. And this was my favorite tune that I learned, and it's the one I remember the, the best. I don't know the name of it because I didn't understand what they were saying. But. And I'll also play a little bit of um, the way that the harmony goes. Fiddling over there is often done in two or three or four um, sets of people at a time. And they'll all be playing different harmonies and layering on drones and, um, you know, playing as hard as they can. And it just sounds so rich. You might have noticed during the dances there were always, like, at least three fiddlers on stage, maybe 20 at one time. <laughs> classical training and um, her bow is doing a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, when I try to play these with Anna, 
when she was here, she didn't know them. And she said, did you learn those from Mia? <laughs> so I guess she has a particular style. <laughs> between the light feeling and the dark feeling, um, because that is what really drew me to this music originally, um, and this is a tune that expresses that. And this is one I learned from Anna, and it's called Gazebo, or translates to the gazebo.
So um, I'll open it up to any questions, any questions at all that you have for me. And hopefully I can answer them. You know, I don't know a ton about the music theory behind um, the Swedish fiddling styles. Um, but I, I do know just from this experience a bit about how it relates to the culture and, um, you know, the different dances and some of the different styles. Yeah, so Katie, how did you start to learn? It was, you know, you showed us you watching this <clears throat> fiddle player. Then what was a lesson or how did you begin to get into their camp, so to speak? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a really good question. Um, I was very happy to realize that it functioned really similarly to how um, the camps over here function, but also how people transmit the tunes how they teach um, is really similar, where they'll play a short, a short piece of the tune, like a few notes, and then everybody repeats that. And I thought that was, yeah, I mean, it's amazing that they do that everywhere, and that's how music gets passed down. So it's a call and response, um, sort of, when I'm teaching kids, I call it the copycat game, you know, and that's how, how you learn them. And then you spend your afternoons practicing and playing with other people, so you really absorb the tune. I was amazed at the complexity of the rhythms. Mm -hmm. And I have two questions. The first one's about rhythm. Um, is any of this written down? And if not, why not? And did you try to write any of this down? <laughs> <laughs> it um, traditionally is not written down. It's an oral tradition. It's passed down in that way um, from fiddle to fiddle. But people are trying to write them down more so, especially at the Royal Academy of Music um, in Stockholm. Uh, someone I had met there was telling me about how difficult it was to write down and that the, um, the time signatures are also constantly changing. You might drop a beat in you know, one area and then you have to adjust the time sig signature accordingly. So it becomes really difficult and um, time consuming to write it down where it's much quicker to just pass it down you know, in terms of learning by ear. Were any of them written to go with stories? They sound like they're telling stories. Don't they? Yeah. I, I feel that way too. Um, and that's where I thought Bjorn's sort of um, integration of the story and the tune and the fox, you know, that whole thing happening um, is an expression of these tunes telling a story in a way. Forevermore, that tune will be associated with the Fox story, and whoever he tells that to, that tune will be associated with it. So I think maybe that's, um, in that way, that's the most it does express storytelling. I'm not sure that there are really stories that go with them. Um, but they are written, or they're, they're often called by the name of someone who played them. And within that is a story, you know? I mean, you can look at it many different ways, but, you know, that someone's going to talk about the person, Bjorn, or whoever passed it down, and um, that tune ends up sort of being that person's story, so, in a way. <laughs> um, oh, a comment and, the, and their question. The first tune that you played um, it was a very, very complex rhythm and was switching major minor. It sounded very similar to, to music that I've heard, Yiddish fiddle music or Russian fiddle yeah. music. Of course, you know, that's not that far apart. Yeah. Um, but the other question is, and in, in um, what stands out immediately about this music is the, the amount of harmony and double stop. And just for anybody who plays, oh, it's really hard to play and play it as well as Katie does. <laughs> Um, but it, other fiddle music around the world, is there music from other traditions that, that uses that anywhere near as much as that? Because I know in the, mm -hmm. in the Celtic and the American and the Quebec traditions, you don't hear that right. nearly. Uh, yeah, those are great things to point out. Um, the first comment you made about it being potentially related to Russian music, that is very true. Um, there's a lot of overlap, people coming and going, and if you look at the history of Sweden and Norway with, um, you know, Germany, Germany's involvement with those two countries um, and other European involvement, there, there is a lot of um, that background. But especially Russian, that was told to me over there that there's 
a lot of Russian folk music threads that mm. go through there. Um, and then the second question, my other love, my other uh, love of music is Cajun music. And that also involves a lot of double stopping and harmonies, usually two, three, or four fiddlers playing um, in a circle together with accordion and other instruments, but uh, the fiddles often play in harmony. Um, I found it there, I found it in old time, and I found it in Swedish, and I'm sure there are a few other traditions, but that, that is really different from Irish music, Scottish music, Celtic music, Québécois. Québécois has a lot of the double stops too, actually. Um, and New England old time. And growing up around here, I never really clung on to our traditional music here. And the reason why is because it, it didn't involve the driving rhythms, the double stops, the harmonies. So I am very curious about that. And I want to look into other cultures and, and musical traditions that involve that. And wondering if there's a thread. I mean, Québécois and Cajun, there is a thread. Yeah. Cajun and Swedish, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll find out though. <laughs> um, yeah, but I love that about the style. Um, yeah, it's pretty unique. Yeah, it's so rich sounding just from one instrument. Yeah. 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 Um, in, the, in Hungary, they, um, there have been uh, some major attempts to, to record uh, some of the traditional folk, folk music in order to avoid it being lost. Uh, that doesn't seem to be a danger uh, in uh, Norway and Sweden. I wonder uh, why that might be. Do you have any idea? Yeah, I mean, I think that is, um, the first thing that comes to mind is that uh, the government is really doing all it, all it can to help the music stay alive and keep it from dying out by making it extremely accessible to young people. You know, you can go to the Royal Academies of, uh, Academy of Music for free and, and they encourage you to study traditional music there. Um, and, you know, there are tons of festivals. I think it's a culture that just has a history of supporting the arts. And that is, um, they're able to do that especially because the government is behind them. It's not just the people saying we need to do what we can to support this. They're, it's been supported by the government for a very long time. Why that? I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, culturally, you know, and their, their sort of emphasis on aesthetics um, and art in general, folk art, um, it just seems like they hold that. And it doesn't seem like it's going to be lost. Although they're, when I'm speaking with people there, they are concerned about that. Um, even though it seemed quite popular to me and I was impressed with the number of young people getting involved with learning the music, um, you know, they're still driven to keep it, keep it alive and they are recording the older artists and taking care of people like Bjorn, but with the government's help, I feel like it's not as scary of a situation because <laughs> they're there. Can I, can I comment on that issue? I, my, I'm sure it must have something to do with the fact that, that Sweden has had such a political and economic stability for so long compared to a place like mm -hmm. Hungary that has been through, you know, such political upheaval for, for so many years that there's you know, so much so much more difficult to keep the culture alive yeah. so that people yeah. be you know, really have to work at it. Yeah, I think that's true. I can definitely see see that. We probably have more questions in the audience, and uh, what we'd like to do at the center is say a formal thank you very much to Katie. I think she'll be here for a little bit longer if you have questions to come up and talk to her. But we won't take any more from the okay. audience. Just, she now. was going to show the piece of artwork oh. from the uh, <laughs> That can be our lab, our final one. <laughs> I thought everybody might want to see that. Actually, I'm really glad you brought that up because Norm is a. Um, He's a folk artist, but he is a complete abstract artist. And again, it's that juxtaposition of um, sort of modern um, versus folk, you know, ancient coming together. And I feel like this is a complete expression of that um, 
it says a lot about what he's doing, but also what it what it's sort of like over there. <laughs> he loves using neon colors, <laughs> and this he told me um, I stayed up almost all night with him my last night at the camp, and um, he was showing me all his different pieces of art. Try very hard to explain it um, in his broken English. And what I got out of him about this, and he went on and on and on, um, is that this is his philosophy on life and death. And this is where I was thinking of Peter Schumann and Brent Puppet a little bit, in that this is uh, the phoenix rising out of um, the ashes of our current world and creating something new and something vibrant here. And um, you know, through all of his gestures and everything, I think I got a pretty clear idea of what he thinks. He thinks that the, you know, the end of the world is coming, and that, uh, but we will rise out of something, and it will be something very beautiful. So, <laughs> this is his expression of that.